We shall now begin the main session, and uh, the main session consists of a speech by Dr. Baudouin Bouquet, director of Nova Civitas in Belgium. Um, Baudouin will talk about the nation state, the European Union, and globalization, libertarian perspectives thereon. The panelists, or those people who will in some way respond to what Boudouin says, are um, Syed Kemal, who needs no introduction, and um, Wolfgang Müller, the director of IUF in Germany. And uh, what is I IUF again? It's a German abbreviation for the Institute for Free Enterprise. Excellent, excellent. And Germany has a glorious tradition of... <laughs> no, actually, Germany does have a glorious liberal tradition. And it's something that we should always bear very strongly in mind. Germany is not just some boring, corpses country with <laughs> good motorways. <laughs> they also used to write some very nice music, I can tell you. <laughs> anyway, I give you both one. Dear libertarian friends, uh, let me first say I was very moved by the commemoration uh, of uh, Christine. As a young libertarian in the 80s, I had a world map, and on each country there was a tag with a name on it. Uh, in on the United States, that was Murray Rothbard. In France, that was Henri Lepage. In Holland, that was Hugh Pjongen. And for England, it was Christine. And I organized a libertarian conference in 82, in Brussels together with Christine. And that was really the start of my um, libertarian liberal commitment. I am a professor at the law school of uh, Ghent, uh, Belgium. Belgium uh, is now headed by Guy Verhofstadt. Guy Verhofstadt uh, was uh, present at the libertarian conference in 82, but he evolved quite in the wrong way. Uh, now he's written a book, uh, The United States of Europe, in which he is hailing the New Deal of the United States as the model for a federal Europe. And his dream is really to become the Vladimir Putin of uh, Europe in the, the near future. <laughs> so I hope, I really hope for next the vetoes of, the, uh, of Great Britain when he runs again for uh, president of the commission. Maybe if my health is not in good shape, it could be uh, Guy Verhofstadt, who is in action. My talk is about uh, the state in uh, liberal theory. Uh, why talking about the state? Uh, we are against it. That's it, we could say. And it's not so easy. Um, at the last meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society in uh, Guatemala, some of you were attended this uh, meeting, I think. Um, Victor van Berg, uh, the uh, president, director of the Walter Eucken Institute, another uh, German uh, free market uh, think tank, uh, presented a paper, Individual Liberty and Political Institutions on, on the Complementarity of Liberalism and Democracy. And in this paper, um, he argued that, uh, first, liberalism, libertarianism, um, has a tradition of strong defense of market uh, society, uh, of a society based on voluntary cooperation and voluntary exchange, uh, based on individual autonomy, what he calls in German uh, a privat rechtsgesellschaft, uh, or mean a society based uniquely on the privat recht in English, that would be more or less the common law. And, uh, but he uh, argued uh, libertarianism is weak in politics proper. And how should we run political communities? And he complained that young libertarians had given up thinking about their um, uh, about this and retreating to certain anarcho-capitalist views in which they reduced the view of liberalism to uh, de merely defending a private rechtsgesellschaft, uh, just a society based on contract and private property, and that's it. 
And he particularly blamed our friend Hans Hermann Hoppe for being too simple on this matter. Although I do not agree with his, conclusion, his conclusions, he has a point in, when stating the problem. Society is not only about exchange trade, but also about cooperation within institutions for collective goods like security, public infrastructure, and justice. And I think it's uh, interesting, and we should stimulate uh, the, the discussion about libertarian alternatives for the state, and if it's not possible uh, to do away with the state, how making the state more liberal. And my talk is somewhat addressing this uh, question. First, if we look back to history, the, the state, the state, the territorial state, England, Belgium, France, uh, the archetypical definition of the state has been given by Max Weber. Um, it's a territorial state, um, and in this territorial state, violence is monopolized by a government. Uh, that is the archetypical definition of the state by Max uh, Weber. And we can say that in Europe, let's say since the uh, 17th century, the Treaty of Munster, Westphalen, the territorial nation state has become the dominant um, way of organizing uh, politics. But if you look back in human history, we can remark a lot of alternatives to state. I, I, this list is not exhaustive. But for instance, tribal societies, uh, where uh, the, the people are held together by a kind of common ancestry, common uh, religion, uh, where, uh, for instance, there is no centralized monopoly of violence, but where violence is decentralized. A nice example is, for instance, uh, uh, medieval Iceland, uh, where uh, there was a legislator, the Althing, the oldest parliament in the world, but where the executive force was decentralized. It were families, kin groups, who had to execute the decisions of the judges, and there was no centralized um, uh, state monopoli monopolizing uh, the use of violence. And it's interesting to see how this uh, Iceland, this medieval Iceland, evolved and how r a relatively a situation of peace and order was maintained, although they had no, no central, centralized organization of violence. You have theocratic polities, uh, po uh, political systems held together by common religion, uh, and not by a territorial organization of the state. Uh, uh, the, an example, a, a pure example, is the Uma in the Islam, uh, where uh, religious leaders uh, are on head of it, and where uh, all uh, members of the Uma, the, the peaceful community of the Islam, has to respond and obey uh, the leaders of the, the, this theocracy. Uh, has Christianity ever been a theocracy? Uh, yes and no, but for instance, between uh, the, the 11th and the 13th century, uh, Europe was more or less in uh, a kind of theocracy, but in a very mild way. Uh, the, the Pope was somewhat the head of the Respublica Christiana, and the emperors and the kings were submitted to the Pope. He had an overarching authority. And that uh, uh, allowed a lot of liberty, in fact, because uh, a lot of decentralized uh, organizations could appeal immediately to the Pope against the, the king. Uh, but that is also not a territorial state. Uh, very interesting, for instance, in history are the city republics. City republics, uh, the, the, the polity is a physical uh, concentration of habitation, the city, uh, and the border is with the countryside. And uh, there, in, if we look to the Middle Ages, you see a lot of city republics nearly run as a business, uh, run by uh, trade families and uh, economically very efficiently uh, run. A typical example is, for instance, Genova in Italy with a very minimal uh, public investment uh, and the, the all public investments was run accordingly to market pressures 
was very cost responsive towards the uh, market. A very libertarian uh, model also for organizing uh, policy problems are city leagues and the main example, we are very pro-German uh, uh, in, in this uh, lecture, uh, is the Deutsche Hansa. Uh, it's, uh, it's worth to be studied by uh, libertarians uh, where you have several uh, city republics associated uh, in a league based on uh, unanimity, uh, that's something our uh, Vladimir Putin wants to abolish in Europe, unanimity, uh, because then uh, we cannot decide uh, quickly about all kinds of matters. Uh, but this uh, association, the City League, the City League, the Deutsche Hansa, managed to preserve the interest of all the members of this, uh, of all its members, the cities, and the trade tradesmen in uh, foreign countries and, and uh, by organizing all kinds of boycott mechanisms, pressure and so on. So they had a kind of political system very libertarian in its uh, structure, but it was wiped out by the pressure of the different nation states and in uh, 1648 the uh, Deutsche Hansa was not invited anymore uh, in order to uh, make the Treaty of Westphalia. They were not part of the club anymore. Neither the church was invited. So 1648 was really the hallmark, the landmark in history for uh, the territorial state. The city-state is somewhat in between. Uh, that's already uh, partially a state that is where a dominant city is conquering other cities and is imposing its power to the other cities. Very typical are the city-states of uh, Renaissance Italy, Machiavelli, Florence. Um, this is, has already the features of a state, but it's not uh, t a totally a state. Then finally you have empires. Empires are systems where one tribe, one political community is extending its power on other tribes, on other people, on other races. Um, empires are not very libertarian, although it can depend, you know. Uh, it depends who is the, dry, the driving force in the empire. For instance, the Roman Empire was had quite uh, libertarian uh, features uh, because it, the, the, the center of the empire was a city republic and had some republican uh, traditions, uh, also its law, the, the Roman law, by which this Roman Empire cannot be compared for, com compared, for instance, with the Assyrian Empire, which were, was very suppressive. The British Empire, uh, we are in England, uh, may have some uh, similar characteristics as the Roman Empire. Uh, what you can say about the Rome, uh, British Empire? Uh, a lot of uh, negative things, but at least they exported some of their cuttings, like the common law, uh, democracy, if you look to India, for instance, uh, and compare it with China, uh, there is a big difference between the traditions um, in these two countries. The, the theory, classical liberal theory uh, on the state was definitely uh, developed and as a pivotal uh, uh, figure, uh, personality, uh, writer in, in this respect, was John Locke. Um, John Locke tacitly uh, accepted the, the territorial nation state, although he did not use these terms, eh? but he accepted the territorial nation state of Great Britain as the platform to organize institutionalized liberty. Uh, John Locke did not discuss uh, the establishment of city leagues in in England, or the restoration of the Respublica Christiana, eh, then he would have been blamed as a papist, and that was the worst thing you could have in England at that time. Uh, but uh, uh, the platform was uh, the English, the British nation state, but that did not need much discussion because the borders of the English nation states were quite clear. The cliffs of Dover, there it ended. So there was no discussion about the territorial borderlines. It was very obvious that this entity would be the platform of political organization, political organization in a, a liberal way. Moreover, uh, England, could rely on the preservation of strong what we call in history proto-liberal. That means liberal features uh, in political organization existing predating the 
the initiation of uh, explicitly liberal thinking of the 18th century. That's what we call proto-liberal. There were a lot of strong proto-liberal traditions, and they were preserved. Uh, a first, part, a first uh, element is feudal reciprocity. In feudalism, oh, liberals tend to look uh, negatively towards feudalism, but there were some very libertarian elements in it. In feudalism, there is a contract between the lord and the vassal, and this contract is reciprocal. And if the lord does not behave well, the vassal can, uh, is relieved from his obligations of obedience towards the lord. That's completely different uh, with the state now. You cannot say to Tony Blair, well, you did not keep your promises, I'm free now. That's not possible. Uh, so there is a quite different. And in fact, the Magna Carta extended this feudal logic uh, of reciprocity to all British free men. Uh, that is a very important uh, element. They all became vassals in a certain sense of the, the king and this reciprocity uh, uh, stated in the Magna Carta uh, was uh, extended, was generalized over all English uh, free men. Uh, uh, local autonomy. Local autonomy always remains strong in in England, uh, and then third, there is the common law, uh, <laughs> developed by the king, but later on becoming a real check for the power of the king. These were very three elements in the English state, uh, which were in fact uh, um, intellectually <coughs> reorganized by John Locke in his theory of the, the classical uh, of classical liberalism the, the, towards the nation state. Uh, there was uh, an evolution in the 19th century. In fact, uh, classical liberalism, pol the political theory of classical liberalism is built forward on John Locke. Without John, we, we cannot think about the classical liberal theory on the state without John Locke. That's a very pivotal figure, uh, personality. But uh, the, um, in the, on the continent, uh, s uh, something had to be added uh, because there these nation states, these self-evident nation states like you have in England, uh, were not uh, present. Uh, there you had a compact uh, landmass um, with, with empires like the Habsburg Empire, like uh, France and so on. And there the discussion arose about the borders of the liberal nation states. Where are the geographical borders to be drawn? Well, it's a very difficult question. Where does the jurisdiction of the nation states end? And where does the jurisdiction of the other nation state uh, begins? And for that matter, a theory was developed of uh, the nation. Um, uh, a state, a state should be linked with a nation, a, peop, uh, a, a group of people a, 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 who has a certain togetherness, uh, uh, a certain homogeneity, and who uh, will form a kind of nation and have a common, common political institution, a state. And, and that, uh, in this sense, nationalism developed on the continent. England did not need much nationalism because it has its natural borders, its insular borders. But in uh, the continent, that was really a problem. In the beginning, this nationalism was quite liberal in the sense that uh, the idea was that all people, all uh, popular com uh, community uh, speaking the same language, having more or less the same culture, had the right to have their own political institutions. For instance, liberal nationalism of the Czechs, of the Slovaks, of the Flemish, uh, and so on, and against imperialistic uh, tendencies against some people dominating uh, other peoples. Uh, that was quite liberal, a quite liberal uh, type of nationalism. So, but the, the problem is that this uh, nationalism evolved towards a nationalism as such. The nation itself became somewhat a notion as such and from which you could derive all kind of principles uh, to organize your society. And then we are in nationalism as such, which is of course a source of a lot of uh, expansion of state interventionism and also a source of a very warlike uh, attitude. So we have to distinguish in nationalism between these two uh, types. Um, America, the, the most important legacy we got from the United States, the United States basically built further on the Lockean tradition and tried to do better than the corrupt England. 
more tolerance, more individual freedom than in the motherland. Uh, that was basically the core of uh, American political thinking, but they added something to it, and that is its uh, uh, practice of federalism. Uh, this split sovereign sovereignty, uh, you're a sovereign not only from the United States, but also from Alabama, from Massachusetts. This split by which, of course, uh, uh, power is distributed across different uh, political uh, entities. Challenges now uh, for the, the future. Free trade and globalization. The state is not a problem. Um, we um, could enjoy, um, and we should be optimistic, uh, we could enjoy uh, since, let's say, the, the 70s, 80s, uh, an evolution towards uh, free trade, large free trade zones, like, for instance, Europe, also in the United States, the NAFTA, the globalization. A very important point is that capital has become much more mobile uh, since, let's say, the 19th century. In the 19th century, capital, industrial capital, was tied to coal mines. They couldn't move. So the state had a huge impact. Now, if a state is regulating too much, capital moves away. So this, uh, this power relationship between capital, uh, companies, and state has shifted in favor of the, the companies because the, the increased mobility of capital, which is very good news. The power of the state has diminished. States have become much more competitive towards each other and have to attract uh, capital. Big example, uh, the next speaker, Matlar, uh, will tell you about uh, corporate tax in uh, Estonia. Corporate tax in Estonia, which is uh, simple to summarize, it's zero. Zero. Uh, wonderful. Uh, and that's, of course, why he could sell this, not only of, uh, because it's a libertarian principle, because Estonian needed to attract capital, and that was, of course, a uh, trump card in, in international competition. Um, so, um, we could be tempted to say, why bother about the state anymore? Because due to this free trade uh, globalization, the state uh, is put into competition like uh, companies on the market. And they will move uh, by external pressure towards more and more uh, liberty because they cannot permit themselves to be very statist, uh, high taxation, high regulation, they, uh, capital and people will move away, will vote with the feet, like we used to say in, uh, political, in the political e economy. So that's the good news, and this should be supported uh, uh, in the future by libertarians. Everything which goes in the direction of free trade, opening borders, should be supported by a libertarian, because the more Socialists complain about something, you should support it. So uh, you should read Socialist Press to see where they are complaining, what they are complaining about, in order to know quite easily what you should uh, support. Uh, but, but there is a big but. Uh, the organization of free trade, uh, uh, free trade uh, market, now has encompasses the danger for the growth of what I call super-state leviathans. And of course, you know what I'm thinking about, uh, the European Union. And on this uh, point, uh, it is very uh, important to, to see the difference, because the, uh, when, when we were liberta young libertarians, the, the, the struggle was between collectivism, uh, uh, state collectivism, and free markets. This uh, discussion has waned, has disappeared. Uh, and now there's only discussion between markets and markets, and some libertarians get somewhat lost. Uh, but it has become much more tricky, the debate. Uh, in the European Union, there is a big difference between what I would call the Thatcher Blair, why not? Uh, Thatcher Blair, Vaclav Klaus, Martlar view on the market, on the free trade market, and that this view is, in fact, uh, we should uh, do away with all trade barriers uh, between the countries, quotas, uh, this should all be given up. Um, so the, their, free, they, their free trade view is in fact a view on deregulation. Deregulation, 
a, a certain type of regulation that's the regulation uh, of the interest, interstate uh, trade, interstate mobility, and so on. That is this view, but there is also an other view, and that's the view uh, developed by Jacques Delors. And this view is not against regulation. Uh, in fact, according to his opinion, everything should be regulated, but the regulation should be the same everywhere. That's his view on the market. Uh, uh, identity, uh, uniformization of regulation. So what is left of free trade is put under the same type set of regulations, but there should be a lot of regulations. That, is, uh, uh, that was very well explained in a very short article in The Economist uh, a couple of weeks ago. These two types of so-called uh, free market. And, and it's uh, clear that libertarians should make this type of discussion more explicit and say, well, there is a type of free market thinking which is uh, conducive for individual liberty, but there's a kind of so-called free market thinking, the French, the French, German, I would put them somewhat in the middle, but the French type of free market is quite anti-libertarian and is in fact conducive for the growth of uh, superstate uh, leviathans. Uh, the idea of the, the managers of the superstate leviathans is not liberal at all. It is to uh, increase the centralized power in these uh, regional or international uh, organization in order to limit competition between the states, set uh, certain limits on fiscal freedom uh, in order to avoid the rat race, stupid theory, the rat race. Uh, if we allow states uh, fiscal freedom, we will end up with states uh, with zero taxation, building no, no roads at all, having no more police, and so on. This is a stupid theory, because companies invest in countries with low taxation, but companies also want good roads, want police protection, and so on. So as long as these things are organized by the state, companies will ask some taxation, but efficient taxation, in order to organize uh, very well. So this rat race argument is bullshit. Sorry for the term, uh, but uh, that is always bought uh, in uh, European uh, politics uh, very successfully in order to increase the power of the the, the superstate Leviathans. Um, so, in a certain way, uh, as libertarians, we are sometimes uh, forced. To, def to take defense of the nation state uh, in order to preserve uh, this competitive pressure on states and also the possibilities of voting with the feet. And there is another element. Some nation state, uh, and certainly England, I'm very pro-English, and I'm not saying this for cheap flattery. I always defended that in my country. But the English nation state uh, is, has also some uh, elements has preserved some elements of its proto-liberal uh, tradition, common law, uh, decentralization, and so on. So, and this is not present at all at the political level of the superstate leviathans, where technocracy, uh, lack of popular control, is uh, dominating the system. So that's an additional reason to uh, defend. Uh, take defense of the nation state as a politic, as a, as a kind of political view. Last point, if I still have some time, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, should we give up? Uh, should we just rely on the defense of the nation state and that's our libertarian position? I don't think so. I think uh, we have to develop alternatives uh, for the nation state because the nation state is maybe better uh, than the super state uh, leviathans for the moment, but it remains a source of force, of violence, of oppression, of potential oppression. For, uh, uh, of oppression for individual liberty. And therefore, uh, it's good that we go on with discussions of alternatives for the nation state, for the state, and organize political um, institutions which are uh, more conducive with individual liberty. In this uh, regard, I would draw your attention to the interesting discussions, for instance, about anarcho-libertarianism. If you look to this, uh, uh, to this uh, chart, to this uh, um, drawing, uh, for instance, uh, there is a in very interesting discussion 
on the viability of uh, uh, a system where we would privatize everything, so also uh, violence and, and the court and the justice uh, system. Now we work with the idea that uh, we can have competition uh, with courts and, and justice systems, we call that private arbitration. There is no monopoly, neither in England, I think, of litigation. Uh, but there should always be a last resort power, and that is uh, one court system should be backed by the violence of the state. And in England, this is the uh, common, court, common law uh, legal system, and in other countries, uh, other ones. Uh, but, and the reason is when one of the parties does not, have, uh, does not, when the two parties does not reach, do not reach, uh, an, an agreement to submit the conflict to a private arbitration, uh, then there is nothing, uh, then people can only use violence and uh, violence will escalate and we will uh, end up in what we call Hobbesian anarchy. That is a, a, a system where life is short, nasty, and sometimes my students say British, but I always correct <laughs> British. Um, <laughs> uh, is this true? And I have to um, uh, refer in this respect to the very, uh, very rich discussion between uh, a couple of American economists, um, the, the, the Independent Institute uh, in, you know, in, in the United States, in Oakland, I think, uh, Vested in Oakland, uh, will edit uh, next year a whole volume on um, anarcho-capitalism with all, nearly all articles, 1,800 pages. Uh, I'm reading them uh, because I have to write a review on that. Uh, but it's uh, huge literature will be, which will be bundled in one volume. Very useful. Next year in your uh, shop. Um, is it already mentioned? Uh, Okay, okay, uh, three minutes. Okay, I'm, I'm finished, nearly. Uh, uh, the discussion here is uh, basically what are the uh, promoters of a kind of anarcho-liberal capitalist system arguing is that this uh, argument of Hobbesian anarchy is probably, very probably wrong. Uh, uh, it's, uh, if you compare with other similar situation, if you analyze from an economic point of view based on self-interest, uh, these private agencies, court systems will make uh, contracts with each other, agreements with each other. If one party of, of, a party of one does not uh, appear for the other one, there will be agreements. So we would quite easily move towards a situation of ordered anarchy, where the main uh, private court systems make agreement with each other. And there are a couple of arguments uh, in favor of that. Uh, if we look to states, states are violent organizations, but if we look to the world, the world is not constantly in war. War is rather the exception. So if states, violent organizations as states, can maintain a relatively uh, uh, situation of peace, why should uh, private companies uh, who have to live from their customers not be able to maintain this? But this argument that we would move to a kind of ordered anarchy with all kind of agreements uh, fires back in the discussion against the promoters of anarcho-libertarianism. An economist like Tyler uh, Cohen, for instance, argues that the, this agreements will lead to collusion will lead to collusion, they will stack together and stand out independent competitors and form a nation state again. So if you move for a while to a kind of anarcho-capitalistic situation, after a couple of years uh, it will move to another equilibrium and that is again a kind of state. That is the argument. Then against this argument there are a couple of other arguments. Very interesting that the agreements are just a problem of coordination, which is easy, more, much more easy to solve while collusion, stamping out, uh, making cartels is a problem of collective action uh, with prisoner's dilemma, which is much more difficult uh, to, to solve. So uh, people like Stringham and so on are maintaining that ordered anarchy could be an equilibrium uh, for the long term. I invite you uh, to go on with this discussion, read this uh, uh, literature uh, so that we are able to preserve uh, the flame of the torch because we are right uh, and that's a reason to go on. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Bodhan. That was very interesting. Um, now, I propose to continue in this way. I would ask uh, Wolfgang and Syed each to speak for about five minutes, and then we have half an hour. I would like to open it up to general discussion. If David Carr is in the room, is David around? I know that David has an extraordinarily depressing question that he likes to ask of those. Who, David likes to ask a very depressing question of those who, who advocate globalization. But uh, if David is here to ask it, I'll put it for him later on. So, who would like to go first, Syed or Wolfgang? I'm actually more than five minutes. So like, uh, okay. Well, so anyway, yeah. Whatever. Okay. I'll be, I'll be very short to conversate. Okay. okay. <coughs> Spontaneous order, so I already say that more than five minutes because um, it's not just a reply on it, it's also um, it's complementary. Okay, coming from Germany, of course, I would like to speak about German economic growth. But there isn't any. <laughs> so actually, I'm okay. I'm exaggerating a little bit. But German economic growth has been almost non-existent, and certainly growth stimulated by local consumption is stagnant. And you heard it in the news for the last few months, with higher taxes just weeks away, consumer spending might contract further. But the only place the German economy has grown is production for export. That brings me to the actual topic of this, globalization. And globalization is really something very simple. It is a discovery that imaginary lines drawn on maps, often by man, dead long ago, don't matter very much. At one time, such lines were considered very important. People fought over them. People died over them. And the lines drawn back then are very different from those today. Once Europe literally had thousands of such lines. Take Germany, for example. Germany only unified in, the, in 1871. Before that, it was made up of 39 independent states. And there were lots of lines on the map. These lines are both important in one sense, and very unimportant in another sense. And I want first to discuss how they are not important. For example, there is this myth that liberalism is about self-sufficient individual, the rugged individual versus the world, the man who asks nothing from others and gives nothing to them. Lone individuals dominating each with their own, within their own kingdom. While liberalism is about individual sovereignty, it is also about social cooperation. If anything, liberalism is more about cooperation than anything else. And free markets encourage cooperation. Ludwig van Mises noted, the division of labor turns a self-sufficient individual into the dependent on his fellow man. The social animal which Aristotle spoke disputes and quarrels, disputes and quarrels harm everyone. Co cooperation improves the lives of everyone. Mises said that when savages come into conflict, it has impact on the economic basis of coexistence. But the matter is quite different when a quarrel breaks out among the members of a community in which labor is divided. In such a society, each individual has specialized functions. No one is longer in a position to live independently because all have the need of one another's aid and support. Self-sufficient farmers who produce their own, on their own farms everything that they and their family need can make war with each other. But when a village divides into factions, the smith on one side, the shoemaker on the other, one faction will suffer from the lack of shoes and the other from the want of tools and weapons. The desire to trade with one another is rooted in the desire of each individual to improve its, his existence to the degree that imaginary lines divide people imaginary lines divide people who wish to improve their own life they compel to ignore those lines in every way feasible you would be hard pressed to find any such political line that was drawn without also finding many individuals trying to get past those lines this natural tendency 
to ignore these lines in economic matters is so strong that politicians who draw the lines often station troops along them to prevent such crossings. In fact, the same politicians often build wall along these lines and they have stationed armed men there with orders to shoot to kill everyone attempting to cross the imaginary line without the approval of the politicians. Yet, no government anywhere has managed to stop such crossings. The most ambitious attempt to do so was the infamous ward in the town where I live, Berlin. Many people think they have seen the wall. They see tall slabs of concrete, concrete which were visible. This, that was just what was seen, but usually there was that what was not, not seen. There was not just one wall, but two, and between them was a hundred meter long area called the death area. It was mined and kept clear of obstructions so that the guards in towers could have a clear shot at everyone attempting to cross. There were 116 such watchtowers. It is estimated that about 240 people died attempting to cross that line. But some 5,000 over the years managed to escape. Year after year, the communist government made the wall harder to cross and still people escaped. So, wherever governments have drawn imaginary lines in the, stand, in the sand, people have crossed them. They ignored them for the reasons that Mises outlined. Even the imaginary lines that people draw in their hearts and minds have been crossed for similar reasons. Religious belief often divided people in violent ways. Yet undercutting this intolerance has been the desire to prosper. Catholics wanted to, to, Catholics wanted to live better lives, so did Protestants. And if that meant they had to trade with one another, then often willing to put the imaginary divisions uh, aside. No doubt, Many on the left would like to think it was consciousness raising that was responsible for this tentative harmony, but the motives were much more selfish. We could go back to 1648. We'd find a man named Henry Parker who wrote a tract called Of a Free Trade. Parker argued that without religious toleration, trade between individuals would be hampered and people would be poorer. Henry Robinson an advisor to the Commonwealth government of Oliver Cromwell also noted that, that the Dutch were more tolerant of religious freedom and prospered as a result. He said similar toleration in England would benefit the English. Sir William Petty wrote that for the enhancement of trade, if that be a sufficient reason, indulgence must be granted in matters of opinion. The advocate of these religious lines were equally aware of this. The chaplain of, to the Earl of Berkeley preached a sermon in 1681 where he warned that it is to be feared that the great outcry for liberty of trade is near of kin to that of liberty of conscience. And Samuel Parker warned in 1669 there is not any sort of people inclined to seditious practice as a trading part of the nation. In fact, this was very much the case. As a great historian of tolerance, Henry Kamen noted, the expansion of commercial capitalism was a powerful factor in the destruction of religious restrictions. Trade was usually a stronger argument than religion. When the apostle of tolerance, Voltaire, described it in practice, it is no accident that he spoke of the stock exchange. He wrote, go into the stock exchange in London, that place more venerable than many a court, and you will see representatives of all the nations assembled there for the profit of mankind. They are the Jew, they are the Mahometan, and the Christian. Deal with one another as if they were of the same religion, and reserve the name of the infidel for those who go bankrupt. Voltaire attributed much of this high much of this higher level of toleration to the focus of commerce and the businessmen who put profit ahead of theology. As Sir Samuel Britton put in his famous essay, Capitalism and the Permissive Society, the breakdown of theological authority, and I would add theological divisions, 
the rise of scientific spirit and the growth of capitalism were interrelated phenomena. Yet, how often do we hear trade condemned today for being impersonal? But it, is, but it is the fact that trade is impersonal that allows us to overlook so many of the imaginary lines that people draw between one another. Let us go back to Mises. He noted, the progressive intensification of the division of labor is possible only in society in which there is an assurance of lasting peace. If the division of labor is to embrace a whole nation, civil war must lie outside the realm of possibility. If it is to encompass the whole world, lasting peace among nations must be assured. Mises says that today we would laugh at the idea of a great city making war on the countryside. Yet, this was often the case. Europe was divided into a number of economic regions that were by and large self-sufficient. When it comes to economic well-being, these imaginary lines don't mean very much. In fact, they are dangerous and destructive. They divide people from one another needlessly, and they make the people on both sides of the line poorer as a result. Yet in another well, way, those lines are very important. Remember that Europe was a continent riddled with independent sovereign states, thousands of them. The great nation state is a relatively modern innovation. As I said, Germany was not united until 1871. Italy was only fully unified after World War I, and, in many, and many Italians would argue they still haven't quite finished the task. While trade was an important factor in diminishing the importance of borders, be they drawn in the sand or in one's heart, it was the existence of multiple political entities that allowed freedom to develop in Europe. The German of the, of the 1700s could pack up and move to a new town with a new political superior with relative ease. That there were so many independent states meant that each state was in competition with one another. If one city-state became too, opp too oppressive, the local merchants packed their bags and left. As historian Ralph Raiko notes, the key to Western development is to be found in the fact that while Europe constituted a single civilization's Latin Christendom, it was at the same time radically decentralized. In contrast to other cultures, especially China, India, and the Islamic world, Europe comprised a system divided and hence competing powers and jurisdictions. After the fall of Rome, no universal empire was able to arise on the continent. Instead of experiencing the hegemony of universal empire, Europe developed into a mosaic of kingdoms, principalities, city-states, a classical domains and other political entities. Edward Gibson in his rise and fall of the Roman Empire observed the same thing. He said, the division of Europe into a number of independent states is productive of the most beneficial consequence of the liberty of mankind. Gibbon made an observation concerning the Roman Empire which is relevant to the European Union today. The empire of the Romans filled the world and when that empire fell into the hands of a single person, the world became a dreary prison for his enemies. To resist was fatal and it was impossible to fly. Europe discovered many principles of liberty because it was divided. Here then is a dilemma today. A regime of globalized trade enriches us. Just as we are better off trading with the grocer down the street or the farmer in the next village, we are also better off trading with producers in the next country or even in the next continent. Tearing down trade walls is a good thing in general. Disconcerting it, might, it may be, frightening to some it may be, but it is still something that creates more benefits than problems. Yet at the same time, we don't want to create political unity. Trade unity brings prosperity, but so does political division, especially when goods and people are allowed to cross those imaginary lines. We in Europe prosper because our economic system developed when Europe was divided. People think there is a great advantage of political unification. But when Europe was divided, China was. When, sorry, but when Europe was divided, China was united. And what was the result? Etienne Balsas wrote to the life of the United China at the time, no private undertaking, nor any aspect of public life could escape official regulation. In the first place, 
there was a whole series of state monopolies. But the tentacles of the Moloch state, the omnipotence of the bureaucracy, extended far beyond this. This welfare state superintended to the last detail every step its subjects took from the cradle to the grave. It sounds as if he was describing the Brussels bureaucracy today. Historian David Landis compared the disunited Europe to the United China. He noted that many rulers of Europe had to attract participants by the grant of franchises, freedoms, and privileges, in short, by making deals. They had to persuade them to come. The exemption from material burdens and grants of economic privilege, moreover, often led to political concessions and self-government. Here the initiative came from below, and this too was essentially European pattern. Implicit in it was a sense of rights and contract, the right to negotiate as well as petition, which gained the freedom and security of economic activity. Landis noted that fragmentation gave rise to the competition, and competition favored, care, favored good care of good subjects. Treat them badly, and they might, and they might go elsewhere. To the degree then that the European Union encourages the movement of goods and labor, we all benefit. To the degree it imposes political conformity, we are in danger. Our prosperity was created precisely because we lacked the political monopolization that dominated China. As we move into a European version of the Chinese empire, we are also destroying competition between nations. We are slowly unifying the stifling regulations so that no nation escapes the smothering influence of Brussels. So, no one hand, so on one hand, we liberals are telling the world that these lines scribbled on a piece of paper don't mean very much. In the world of trade and exchange, there are obstacles to be overcome. But at the same time, we can't ignore that these lines played an important role by forcing the mosaic of states to compete with one another and offering more and more freedom to their people. It is no accident that as Europe becomes more unified, the people become less free. Thank you. Thank you for that, Wolfgang, and the Libertarian Alliance would be delighted to publish that text, if you would allow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to throw the floor open now to um, Syed, who has some comments to make. I don't think that we shall have time in this session to open it up to the general audience, but um, there will be plenty of time in the next session. So How long have you got, one? We have another <laughs> ten minutes, I should well, say. I can just do two minutes and then open it up, maybe. Thank Probably. you. Right. Is that all um, yeah, I, d I didn't really intend to come and give a speech. I, I was here just to sort of make some initial comments from my perspective as a member of the European Parliament. Um, and there are lots of issues that were touched upon, which I, do want, which I would want to talk about, but I'll keep it short to allow, allow, allow you time to come in. I, I know there's stuff I'll, I'd want to say about the Uma and theocracy from my personal perspective <coughs> and the difficulty that we have engaging with the Islamic world as a result of the decentralised nature of uh, the Islamic world. Um, but what I will do is talk specifically about the EU. Um, and we have lots of problems. We have, you know, we have problems in dealing with the EU as classical liberals, as libertarians, um, and I think those of you who were here last year would have heard me speak about my own personal dilemma of being a member of the European Parliament mm -hmm. and how do we see the EU um, and you know, the good things and the bad things about it and the, my dilemma came down to this do we believe that there should be competition between different economic and social models um, between, diff uh, between different countries and that over time the best model will win out and we know in our hearts that that will be a model that is one of economic freedom um, and personal freedom. But it will take time. It will take much longer than we wanted to. And as Chris, uh, Chris Tamer, who was here last year, said, it will take much longer than we may want it to. But if, in, over time, um, the countries with the best models, the, you know, the countries that have economic freedom and economic liberalism, will win out. And the other countries will realise the... Um, that the, their system of more protectionism or a social model will lose out and adopt economic freedom? Or, on the other hand, do we look to the EU and use the EU as a tool? 
in the same, same way that the so socialists used to use the EU as a tool to spread socialism through the back door. Can we control the EU to such a way that we use the EU to impose liberalism over the heads of reluctant national governments? Um, you know, the EU can be used and has been used, for example, to open up markets. Not as many markets as we want to, but over the heads of the reluctant government. The telecoms market in France, the postal market um, will be opened up. Um, the energy markets are now being reviewed. And they, and they will be opened up over the heads of reluctant national governments. But the counter-argument to that is, actually, is the EU liberal? Can the EU be liberal? You may have these one or two examples, but in a whole host of other areas, the EU is in fact illiberal. Because it doesn't believe in competition, it believes in harmonisation. Harmonisation over competition. And that's the dilemma we face you know, in our response to the EU. So therefore, if we go back to the nation-state argument and believe in competition between different nation-states and different models, and the best model will win over time, one is that we have to be patient, incredibly patient, to, you know, to wait one day for the French or the Germans or, or whoever to realise or recognise that you know, economic freedom, uh, liber liberalism, uh, deregulation is, 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 is the best way forward. But we also have to recognise that that allows member states to be protectionist. Even though we may, even though we, even though we may open up our market. So for example, as Britain has opened up its energy markets, a lot of people, you know, it's very difficult as a politician to sell this idea, because they'll say to me, well, you know, we've opened up our markets, we have French and German country, uh, companies controlling our utilities, but we can't get a foothold in these markets. But sometimes we also blame the EU for the problems. Um, I was having a discussion at Coffee, and I won't say who with, and they said, well, one of the problems with the EU is that it allows um, all these immigrants to come in from all the rest of, rest of the EU. But actually, if we are libertarians, even if we weren't in the EU, would we would not believe in a free movement of goods and a free movement of people? So we can't necessarily blame the EU. I just think I'll leave it there, just, just a sort of a few introductory comments. Thank you.